In the beginning, part 14, the chapter is entitled A Survey of Scientific Opinion Critical of Evolutionary Theory. The uh, book we've been looking at is entitled In the Beginning, Subtitle Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. It's uh, edited by Brian Ball, who uh, was born in England, got his MA in religion from Andrews University and a PhD from the University of London, then went into church work of various kinds, uh, eventually became a conference president and then the principal of Adv Avondale College, and finally president of the South Pacific Division. And uh, he's married to Don and they have three children. This is written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive, as the introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. It's uh, mostly about theology, uh, such things as evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and arguments for a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, but it does include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, Ariel Roth, and uh, today's chapter, which is uh, from James Gibson. It also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality, which are the next uh, two chapters we'll be going over. Um, James Gibson got his BA from Pacific Union College, his MA from Pacific Union College, and then taught secondary school, both here in the United States and also in West Africa. Uh, then he came back, got his PhD from Loma Linda University here in 1984, and uh, joined the staff of the Geoscience Research Institute, and is, since 1994 has been the director of the Geoscience Research Institute and the ed editor of Origins. And um, so he starts his chapter saying, a review of scientific opinion that is skeptical about the aspects of evolutionary theory involve a number of challenges. First, the term evolution is used with such a variety of meanings that it is not circumscribed in a single definition. Second, evolution is a theory about history, which means that it's exceptionally difficult to test. Third, the theory has enormous philosophical implications that often restrict the way in which empirical evidence is interpreted. Fourth, the experts themselves disagree on many aspects of evolutionary theory, being united primarily by their opposition to any supernatural involvement. Now, those four things he is going to detail, this is basically almost a summary of, you know, say what you're gonna say, say it, and then say what you said at the end. In this paper, I will review each of these points and then discuss five major questions, noting some of the arguments scientists use against various ideas within evolutionary theory. Most of the scientists quoted here are evolutionists. A few are theists are of unknown persuasion. All evolutionary biologists, by definition, believe in common ancestry and descent with modification, regardless of any potential misgivings about the mechanism. The purpose of these quotations is not to show that evolutionists don't believe in evolution, since clearly they do. The point is that many informed scientists have strong doubts about major aspects of the general theory of evolution. Um, and uh, this, of course, brings up uh, an argument that he notes. Some naturalistic scientists vehemently object to such efforts, labeling them quote, mining, as though it is illegitimate to use expert testimony to point out the problems in evolutionary theory. Others feel that evolutionary theory does not deserve any special protected status, and we ought to be informed on any theory's weaknesses. A Canadian biologist, W.R. Thompson, wrote in a 1956 introduction to Darwin's Origin of Species, as we know, there is a great divergence of opinion among biologists, not only about the causes of evolution, but even about the, natu the actual process. This divergence exists because the evidence is unsatisfactory and does not permit any certain conclusion. It is therefore right and proper to draw the attention of the non-scientific public to the disagreements about evolution. But some recent remarks of evolutionists show that they think this is unreasonable. 
This situation where scientific men rally to the defense of a doctrine they are unable to define scientifically, much less demonstrate with scientific rigor, attempting to maintain its credit with the public by the suppression of criticism and the elimination of difficulties is abnormal and undesirable in science. Now, uh, in defense of what uh, James Gibson is doing, I might point out that basically it's a little bit like this. The uh, defense attorney is called into court because um, it is alleged that his client broke a vase that he had borrowed from someone else and that he needed to pay for it. And um, the attorney says, well, first of all, there never was any vase. Secondly, um, my uh, client didn't borrow the vase. Thirdly, it was broken when he borrowed it. Fourthly, it was intact when he returned it. Um, and we smile a little bit about that. But the situation is a little bit that way in evolutionary theory, in that any defense that will work is used. And there are people who will say, but that defense is no good. And they're right. And then some other defense will be tried. And there are people who say, but that defense is no good. And they're right. And the problem is that there is no good defense. But it's almost as if you're throwing up a, a smoke screen. And what we're trying to do is cut through that. And it is legitimate to say, look, evolution could be right in a number of different ways, but this is not one of them. And to quote somebody on the other side for saying so. It's called an admission against interest. And the thing that's interesting is that we're starting to get to the point where admissions against interest are realized for the powerful <coughs> testimony that they are. And so people will look right into the camera and spin and spin and spin and try to get, keep the same spin going so that everybody believes the story when in fact it's not true. We're seeing this right now in, in politics. But it is, um, what's happening is that people are realizing that getting your story straight is more important than telling the truth. And so people will, uh, say things that are clearly contradicted by the facts. But as long as they maintain the same story, nobody can ever use their admission against evidence against them. Of course, it turns one into a total liar doing that, but there uh, is a significant portion of the population that uh, doesn't mind being liars as long as you can't prove it, or as long as, uh, uh, as long as they never have to admit that they're wrong. And in fact, this whole thing about quote mining is basically a way of saying shut up. Because they will quote mine creationists in exactly the same way and feel it's perfectly legitimate to do that. It's only when their own viewpoints are attacked that they, that they object to the quote mining. Now, I will say that there is a form of quote mining that I object to. And that is where you use the quote in a way in which the author uh, in which you are not conveying the original meaning of the author. Um, 
you quote somebody as saying something when what he really said was that somebody else was saying something. Uh, that's not fair, and I think we have to be careful. But um, I think James Gibson will be careful in this situation. First, evolution and equivocation. Um, again, this is the Reader's Digest version. If you want the full version, you'll have to read it in the book. Um, and uh, uh, evolution can mean many things. It may mean a common ancestor. It may mean naturalistic process. It can mean simply change over time. And Philip Johnson uh, has some quotes. And I'm trying to give the quotes because they're kind of the primary evidence that uh, James Gibson is uh, citing, basically. These propositions go far beyond anything empirical science can demonstrate, of course the propositions of evolution. And to sustain this worldview, Darwinists had to resort to all the tactics that Popper warned truth seekers to avoid. Their most deceptive device is the deceptive use of the vague term evolution. Evolution in Darwinist usage implies a completely naturalistic metaphysical system in which matter evolved to its present state of organized complexity without any participation by a creator. And we'll see more quotes that nail that down. But evolution, uh, evolution also refers to much more modest concepts, such as microevolution and biological relationship. The tendency of dark moths to preponderate in, in a population when the background trees are dark, therefore demonstrates evolution. And also demonstrates, by semantic transformation, the naturalistic descent of human beings from bacteria. If critics are sophisticated enough to see that population variations have nothing to do with major transformation, uh, that should be a comma there, um, transformations, Darwinists can disavow the argument from macroevolution and point to a relationship as the fact of evolution. Or they can turn to biogeography and point out that species on offshore islands closely resemble those on the nearby mainland. Because evolution means so many different things, almost any example will do. The trick is always to prove one of the more modest meanings of the term and treat it as proof of the complete metaphysical system. Um, then as ev evolution as an experimental or historical question. And he quotes uh, Jerry Fedora and Missimo, Missimo Pietelli Palmarini. Very roughly, uh, Mm, something's missing there. Historical science, I think it is. Explanations offer not laws, but plausible narratives. Narratives that purport to articulate the causal chain of events leading to the event that is to be explained. Nomological explanations are about metaphysically necessary relationships among properties. Historical re explanations are about causal relationships among uh, events. And then I'm skipping a part of a paragraph. History, natural history included, is about what actually happened. It is not about what had to happen or even about what would happen if Mother Nature were to try again. What had to happen is the domain of theory, not history. And there isn't any theory of evolution. Now, if I were to select that, and there, there isn't any theory of evolution and use it as a quote, that would be quote mining, unless I had explained before what, he mean, what they mean by theory. Colin Patterson of the British Museum of Natural History wrote, Taking the first part of the theory that evolution has occurred, it says that the history of life is a single process of species splitting and progression. This process must be unique and unrepeatable, like the history of England. This part of the theory is, is therefore a historical theory about unique events, and unique events are by definition not parts of, part of science, for they are unrepeatable and so not subject to test. Uh, creationists oftentimes make the distinction between historical science 
and uh, experimental science, and some people criticize us for it, but obviously there are others who have the same feeling, and they're not necessarily on our side. Philosophical bias in science and evolution. And uh, he cites Dawkins who says, biology is a study of complicating things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Uh, and then spends the rest of his book persuading us that we should not trust those appearances. Uh, and then he cites the uh, oft-quoted uh, text by uh, Richard Lewontin. And by the way, uh, this is available on the internet and uh, I strongly <laughs> urge you to read the whole article. This is just kind of the crystallizing paragraph, but the whole article reinforces this. Uh, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. As he set up as science is against the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. The eminent Kant scholar Louis Beck used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow that at any moment the regularities of nature may be ruptured, that miracles may happen. And um, Lewontin is uh, very clear on that. Uh, it's not the evidence that drives us this way, it's our prior commitment. Evolutionary theory is not cl defined clearly enough for scientific use. And uh, he cites an Anthony Hoffman, a committed neo-Darwinist, who wrote, chapter three then presents the neo-Darwinian paradigm of evolution, or rather what I think should be understood under that, this heading. There are nearly as many interpretations of neo-Darwinism as there are evolutionary biologists. And I do not pretend to offer here either a consensus or the most appropriate view. I believe, however, that my interpretation is both internally and externally coherent and sufficiently broad, though not all-encompassing, to be consistent with the opinions of the majority of those who call themselves neo-Darwinists, or neo-Darwinians. And then uh, he quotes Jerry Coyne, who says, in science's pecking order, evolutionary biology lurks somewhere near the bottom, far closer to phrenology than to physics. This, by the way, is somebody who vigorously defends um, evolutionary biology. For evolutionary biology is a his historical science, a theme we've heard before, laden with history's inevitable imponderables. We evolutionary biologists cannot generate a Cretaceous park to observe exactly what killed the dinosaurs. And unlike harder scientists, we usually cannot resolve issues with a simple experiment such as adding tube A to tube B and noting the color of the mixture. Philip Skell, uh, quoting A.S. Wilkins, editor of the journal uh, Bioessays, who wrote in 2000, evolution would appear to be the indispensable unifying idea and at the same time a highly superfluous one. Um, Skell comments, I would tend to agree. He then explains. Certainly my own research with antibiotics during World War II received no guidance from insights provided by Darwinian evolution, nor did Alexander Fleming's discovery of bacterial inhibition by penicillin. I recently asked more than 70 eminent researchers if they would have done their work differently if they had thought Darwin's theory was wrong. 
the responses were all the same. No. I also examined the outstanding biodiscoveries of the past century, the discovery of the double helix, the characterization of the ribosome, the mapping of genomes, research on medications and drug reactions, improvements in food production and sanitation, the development of new surgeries, and others. I even queried biologists working in areas where one would expect the Darwinian paradigm to have the most beneficial research, such as the emergence of resistance to antibiotics and pesticides. Here as elsewhere, I found that Darwin's theory had provided no discernible guidance, but was brought in after the breakthroughs as an interesting narrative gloss. Questions about abiogenesis. And he quotes George Wald. We tell the story, that is abiogenesis, to beginning students in biology as though it represented a triumph of reason over mysticism. In fact, it is very nearly the opposite. The reasonable view was to believe in spontaneous generation, the only alternative to believe in a single primary act, act of supernatural creation. There is no third position. For this reason, many scientists a century ago chose to regard the belief in spontaneous generation as a, quote, a philosophical necessity, end quote. It is a symptom of the philosophical poverty of our time that this necessity is no longer appreciated. Most modern biologists, having reviewed with satisfaction the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis, yet unwilling to accept the alternative belief in special creation, are left with nothing. Francis Crick, who uh, said, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. But he goes on to say, but this should not be taken to imply that there are good reasons to believe that it could not have started on Earth by a perfectly reasonable sequence of fairly ordinary chemical reactions. Almost a miracle, but... Uh, The, see, that last is, is actually a spin kicking in. You know it has to be, so therefore it must have been. Um, never mind the evidence. Questions about universal common ancestry, or what's called monophily. Uh, Christian Schwab and Gregory War, who critique ther current theories of evolution suggesting a polyphyletic, but still naturalistic, origin of life. We believe that it's possible to drop a list of basic rules that underline existing molecular evolutionary models. And this is a somewhat sarcastic list of rules. All theories are monophyletic. See, we only allow monophyletic theories. Single con a common ancestor of life, meaning that they all start with the ur gene, the hypothetical ancestral gene, and the ur cell, the hypothetical ancestral cell. I believe both of those are German terms, and you can actually see cell in cell, um, which have given rise to all proteins in all species, respectively. Two, complexity ma evolves mainly through duplications and mutations in structural and control genes. Three, genes can mutate or remain stable, migrate laterally from species to species, spread through a population by mechanisms whose operation is not fully understood, evolve coordinately, splice, stay silent, and exist as pseudogenes. Four, ad hoc arguments can be invented, such as insect vectors or viruses, that can transport a gene into places where no monophyletic logic could otherwise explain its presence. And they say this liberal spread of rules, each of which can be observed and used by scientists, does not just sound facetious, but also, in our opinion, robs monophyletic molecular evolution of its vulnerability to disprove, and thereby of its entitlement to the status of a scientific theory. Um, at least, uh, this is back to um, uh, Jim Gibson, 
At least three patterns in the fossil record seem discordant with expectations based on monophyly. Uh, the one, the ubiquity of abrupt appearance, suggests discontinuity rather than monophyly. And uh, he goes on to say, in addition to the uh, Cambrian explosion, other radiations include Eocene bats, Cretaceous angiosperms, Paleocene birds, Paleocene mammals, and Paleocene tele teleost fish, or Acanthomorpha. Uh, Charles Darwin said, quote, the case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. And I would say with time the problem is getting worse rather than better. Um, by the way, I have omitted all the references. Uh, if you want them, there they will also be in the book. Um, but there are references to for the, that list. And then Ernst Meyer is quoted as saying, paleontologists have long been aware of a seeming contradiction between Darwin's postulate of gradualism, confirmed by the work of population genetics, and the actual findings of paleontology. Following phyletic lines through time seem to reveal only minimal gradual changes but no clear evidence for any change of a species into a different genus or for the gradual origin of an evolutionary novelty. Anything truly novel always seemed to appear quite abruptly in the fossil record. Meyer adds, this is not surprising, since new evolutionary departures seem to take place almost invariably in localized isolated populations that are not apt to leave a fossil record. Um, or, of course, the other possibility is that uh, what you see is actually what you get. And they do appear suddenly. The pattern of disparity before diversity is inconsistent with monophyly. Um, as uh, Gibson notes, evolutionary theory would predict that species differences would be small at first, with new higher taxa appearing only late in evolution. And then he quotes Stephen Jay Gould, measured as number of species, Burgess diversity is not high. This fact embodies a central paradox of early life. How could so much disparity in body plans evolve in the apparent absence of substantive diversity in the number of species? For the two are correlated more or less in lockstep by the iconography of the cone. That is, the theory requires that. Several of my colleagues, and he cites a couple of them. Um, by the way, these ellipses are in Gibson's quote. I have suggested that we eliminate the confusion about diversity by restricting this vernacular term to the first sense, number of species. The second sense, difference in body plans, should then be called disparity. Using this terminology, we may acknowledge a central and surprising fact of life's history. Marked decrease in disparity, followed by an outstanding increase in diversity within the few surviving designs. Fossil gaps are systematic, not random, suggesting discrete lineages rather than monophyly. And he cites Michael Denton, who says, the fundamental problem in, in explaining the gaps in terms of an insufficient search for or in terms of the imperfection of the record, is their systematic character. The fact that there are fewer transitional species between the major divisions than between the minor. And by theory, there's only a few steps between, let's say, two different species of cat. You should have, uh, it, you should, you should be lucky to find the uh, the intermediate species. On the other hand, between cats and dogs, there should be quite a list. Between cats and, um, and mice, there should be quite a bit more. And between cats and birds, there should be a lot more. The more you have, the, the wider the gap, the more intermediate species there should be, and therefore the more you should find in the record. But this is the exact reverse of what is required by evolution. Um, 
I, I should say the fact that there are fewer transitional species between the major divisions than between the minor. In other words, that what we said isn't what happens. You actually find more of them between two different species of cats, for example, than they do between cats and uh, mice. But this is the exact reverse of what is required by evolution. Discontinuities we might be able to explain away in terms of some sort of sampling error, um, but their systematic character defies all explanation. If the gaps really were the result of an insufficient search, or the result of the imperfection of the record, then we should expect to find more transitional forms between mouse and whale than between dog and cat. Malcolm Gordon, University of California, Los Angeles, says, no fossils are known that relate directly to the vertebrate transitions to land, that is, coming from fish to amphibians. The geographic distribution and morphological diversity of the fragmentary remains has posed problems and has led to controversy as to whether amphibians are monophyletic, that is, they share a common ancestor, or polyphyletic, that is, they have multiple ancestors, and whether they arose from freshwater or marine fishes. These earliest fossil amphibians were already at that time, and that's my misspelling, quite large in size, structurally diverse, fairly specialized, uh, and phylogenetically well differentiated from one another. There are no plausible connections between these earliest fossil amphibians and living amphibians. That is, they don't look like frogs or toads or salamanders. Uh, enough like them to put them in the same uh, class, but not enough like them to, uh, to say that they're closely related. That is, the morphologies of these two groups are so different that there is no scientifically justifiable way to derive the latter group from the former group. Uh, and then he talks about the mammal-like reptiles and cites David Raup, who says, the evidence we find in the geologic record is not nearly as compatible with Darwinian natural selection as we would like it to be. In other words, there are not enough intermediates. Uh, monophyly is based on parsimony of explanation within a naturalistic metaphysic. This is uh, Jim Gibson speaking. If one accepts the possibility of supernatural activity, the evidence is more compatible with polyphyly, and some kind of supernatural creation is the most likely explanation, as long as you don't rule it out to begin with. Questions about the reliability of estimating evolutionary relationships. And then he cites doubts about ref inferring relationships on the basis of genetic similarities. To say that an organ in one species is homologous with an organ in a different species is to mean that the organ was inherited by both species from a common ancestor. Biologist David Mendel, University of Michigan, and Axel Meyer, University of Konstanz, Germany, wrote, Alternatively, the genetic basis of, for important developmental processes can both change and vary among taxa. This is seen in the case of the homo, homeo domain transcription factor. That's a protein that turns on a gene, which is called even skipped. Having an important role in pattern formation in drosophilia embryos, but not in the locust Schistocerca americana or the wasp Aphidius uh, irvi, in spite of homologous structures, that is, segments, being present in all three groups. So even skipped is in Drosophila, but not in the other two. The opposite effect is also seen. Structures regarding as non-homologous may be directed by genes that appear to be homologous. For example, the gene distal less acts in the development of the jointed legs and antennae in drosophila, drosophily, the limbs of tetrapods, the siphons of tunicates, and the tube feet of echinoderms, none of which are supposed to have evolved from the other. And then uh, Scott Gilbert said, the segmentation of dros drosophila and the segmentation of vertebrates has been, had been a classic example of analogy. That is, there, there's, there's vaguely similar looking things, but they're not related to each other. 
Yet here, it was seen as being directed by a homologous set of genes. This demonstration of, quote, homologous, end quote, genes for, quote, analogous, end quote, processes and structures has wreaked havoc with our definitions of analogy and homology. Uh, and then he cites the eyes of insects, the eyes of squid, and the eyes of mammals, all of whom are not supposed to have inherited eyes uh, from their, uh, well, except for, I guess, mammals, which, which uh, inherited them from fish, supposedly. Um, the other ones um, are supposed to have developed them on their own. Um, and yet they all use PAC-6, or EY, as it's sometimes known. One, one alternative is that the laws of nature constrain development so that only certain morphological patterns are possible. And he cites R.D.K. Thomas as saying, the constraints of geometry, growth patterns, and raw materials on which we have focused in this paper constitute formal causes of skeletal design. These do explain the convergence of numerous lineages on general patterns and the relatively complete exploitation of design elements defined in the skeleton space. Uh, he talks uh, about doubts about molecular homology, and um, uh, he's discussing in particular horizontal gene transfer, which I put in yellow since he doesn't actually use that term uh, except in the quote, which I'm going to give you from Michael uh, Sivanen. There has been recent dis discussion that horizontal gene transfer is too frequent and that it may never be possible to reconstruct the last common ancestor. However, if biochemical unities could be achieved after speciation events by horizontal gene transfer, then there is no reason to postulate that a last common universal ancestor ever existed. If horizontal gene transfer is as common as I am implying, the modern cell could have evolved in multiple parallel lineages. Earliest life could have been truly polyphyletic. And everybody's just sharing genes. And then there's the problem of the reverse kind of thing, Orphan genes, and we humans, by the way, have them uh, genes that are not present in chimpanzees at all, or in gorillas or anything else like that. Um, in contrast, there are large numbers of unidentified genes in a variety of organisms that look conventional in every way. Where these unique sequences are coming from and what they do remain baffling mysteries. And he quotes uh, Naomi Sio. If proteins in different organisms have descended from common ancestral proteins by duplication and adaptive variation, why is it that so many today show no similarity to each other? Why is it that we do not find today any of the necessary intermediate sequences that must have given rise to these orphan genes? They just, like they're planted there. Scott Peterson of the J. Craig Venner Institute said, a third and extremely interesting possibility is that many gene functions have evolved independently more than once since the beginning of cellular life on the planet. And about this time you start thinking, how hard is it to ev evolve once? And now we're saying it happened again and again and again, and you get the same gene. Um, this is like the person who won the lottery and then won it the next day or the next week, the next time it was done. At some point, you're starting to think this, this is not chance. Uh, Ford Doolittle is quoted as saying, homology is still a funny word. In the context of proteins and genes, it makes sense only if we don't think about it too deeply. He then adds, if there was no ancestor, however, how can we avoid thinking about the possibility that all genes are ultimately derived from a single uh, short RNA, the first replicating ribozyme? If this is true, all genes are homologous. We might still be able to distinguish between orthologs, that is, the same members of a gene family, and paralogs, that is, different members of a gene family, the result of gene duplication, as a matter of logical principle or theory, if you want to put it that way. But in practice, this will often be impossible. 
homology itself becomes a useless word unless we redefine it to mean something like statistically more similar, more similarity than we would expect on the basis of chance. Such an operational definition is slippery. Genes can fade in and out of a state of homology, depending on the kinds of analysis and the background database with which, within which we compare them. It's a short step from there back to percent homology, homology, which, you know, they're either homologous or they're not, it should be. It is ironic that the words we seem to need in order to think productively about biology, words like, such as homology, individual, organism, and species, have no precise meaning. Doubts about the evolutionary tree of life, which is related to what we just uh, were talking about. Many individual trees have been constructed, while many in individual trees have been constructed, a single universal tree has been an unexpectedly difficult tax task, and he quotes Michael Lynch, who uh, we've seen in other contexts is definitely not a creationist. Clarification of the phylogenetic relationships of the major animal phyla. This is things like, you know, starfish, uh, annelid worms, humans, has been an elusive problem with analyses based on different genes and even different analyses based on the same genes, yielding a diversity of phylogenetic trees. Some resolution has been obtained by selecting sets of characters that produce mutually consistent phylogenies. But this comes at the cost of discarding the inconsistent data. And then he quotes Carl Woese. Extant life on Earth is descended not from one, but from three distinctly different cell types. He's talking about archaea, bacteria, and uh, uh, trying to think of what the, you, pardon, eukaryotes. It's blocking, I'm sorry. It's prokaryotes, uh, archaea, and eukaryotes. Yeah. Um, however, the designs of the three have developed and matured in a communal fashion along with those of many other designs that along the way have become extinct. And Malcolm Gordon says, the base of the universal tree of life appears not to have been a single root, but was instead a network of inextricably intertwined multiple branches deriving from many, perhaps a hundred or more, genetic sources. So all those beautiful pictures of the tree of life that you see, they're not considered accurate at this point. Um, although, don't say that at Panda's Thumb, because you'll have people that will define the old status quo very vigorously. Um, Questions about natural selection as, a cap as capable of creating morphological novelty. Well, of course it can't. You have to have mutations to do that. Uh, doubts about the available suit suitable mutations. That's the problem. And he quotes A.D. Bradshaw as saying, most species are very stable, and in situations where evolution is observed in one species, often none is found in others, despite equivalent opportunity. Evolutionary failure is commonplace. Despite the occurrence of high levels of protein polymorphism, there is good evidence that the supply of variation making a major contribution to fitness is very limited. As a result, it is argued that lack of evolution in mo many, most species may be due to a lack of appropriate variability rather than to other causes, a condition for which the term genostasis is proposed. And then Jeffrey Levington says, as a general rule, major developmental mutants give a picture of hopeless monsters rather than hopeful change. Epigenetic and genetic uh, pleiotropy, that is a single factor, has many different effects. Both impart great burdens to any major developmental perturbation. Something that might affect the heart better might affect the lungs or the liver or some other organ system or perhaps the skin in a bad way. Thus it is unlikely that mutants affecting any fundamental pre-pattern in development are likely to produce a functional organism. The Cyclops mutant of Artemia is lethal. The homeotic mutants, that's produced by mutations of genes controlling development, 
of Drosophila melanogaster suffer similar fates. Doubts about the creative ability of natural selection. He cites uh, Maywan Ho and Peter Saunders who wrote an article saying, among other things, and again, I'm skipping over, it's really rich, uh, it's, I almost wish I had two hours and then just go through the whole thing. But um, it is now approximately half a century since the neo-Darwinian synthesis was formulated. A great deal of research has been carried out within the paradigm it defines. Yet the successes of the theory are limited to the interpretation of the minutia of evolution, such as the adaptive change in the coloration of moths. While it has remarkably little to say on questions which interest us most, such as how there came to be moths in the first place. And again, I'm skipping over a few paragraphs. Um, natural selection and the problems of stasis in the fossil record, and he quotes Joel Kraft. Indeed, the factual information that Darwin presents, there was virtually none, seems to support a philosophical and scientific viewpoint opposite to that of his own. Darwin was the consummate theorist, a scientist of the highest stature who did not let data stand in his way. Um, the fossil record, seemingly so important for anyone advocating evolutionary modifications through time, was not very kind to Darwin's cause. As a result, he ignored it. The fossil record certainly did not make him alter his theorizations or expectations. In fact, what he often saw was stasis. And again, I'm skipping through a little bit of things. Uh, Doubts about providence in the process of evolution. Darwin emphatically rejected any appeal to divine guidance in evolution, in spite of the fact that you'll hear people say, well, we can just combine it. Well, this is what Darwin's opinion was. I entirely reject, as my, in my judgment, quite unnecessary, any subsequent addition of new power and attributes and forces, or of any principle of improvement except insofar as every character which is naturally selected or preserved is in some way an advantage or improvement. Otherwise, it would not have been selected. If I were convinced that I required such additions to the theory of natural selection, I would reject it as rubbish. I would give nothing for the theory of natural selection if it requires miraculous additions at any one stage of descent. The whole project was to get God out of the picture. And uh, Jerry Coyne says, true, there are religious scientists and Darwinian churchgoers, but this does not mean that faith and science are compatible, except in the trivial sense that both attitudes can be simultaneously embraced by a single human mind. It is like saying that marriage and adultery are compatible because some married people are adulterers. The two concepts, of course, are diametrically opposed to each other. And then David Hull talks about what kind of God can one infer from the sorts of phenomena epitomized by the species on Darwin's Galapagos Islands? The evolutionary process is rife with happenstance, contingency, incredible waste, death, pain, and horror. And uh, it cites several instances of this kind of thing happening. And then he goes on to say, whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory Oh, by the way, the, the ellipsis is, uh, is uh, Gibson's. I just happened to read the whole quote. Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of the Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. And uh, we'll skip by a few other things. Um, but uh, quote Steven Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize, although I understand pretty well how brightly colored feathers evolved out of a com competition for mates, it is almost irrevis irresistible to imagine that all this beauty was somehow laid on for our benefit. But the god of bird and trees would have to be also the god of birth defects and cancer. 
And um, in conclusion, he says, um, modern science is dominated by naturalistic philosophy, which rules out any divine activity. As such, abiogenesis and natural selection, or something similar, are the only options available for explaining the origin of biodiversity. These two ideas persist not because they have been scientifically tested and shown to be reasonable, but because of a distaste for anything supernatural. This is, of course, uh, Dr. Gibson speaking. The statements quoted here, mostly from well-informed and committed evolutionary scientists, show that abiogenesis and natural selection are widely seen as unsatisfactory attempts to explain the presence and diversity of life, respectively. Distaste for the supernaturalism inherent in special creation may be a factor in the insistence that evolution has to be true. Biologist D.A.S.M. Watson, University College London, wrote, The extreme difficulty of obtaining the necessary data for any quantitative estimation of the efficiency of natural selection makes it seem probable that this theory, natural selection, will be reestablished, re if it be so, by the collapse of alternative explanations which are more easily attacked by observation and experiment. If so, it will present a parallel to the theory of evolution itself, a theory universally accepted, not because it can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. And then Gibson finishes up to say, perhaps the time has come to remind the scientific world of special creation. The contemporary naturalistic picture of the world, which excludes divine activity before even examining the evidence, is a failure. One can wonder how different our picture of the nature would be if it were reframed with the liberating knowledge of a creator God whose eternal power and creative nature can be seen in the things he has made. Uh, my, my own take is that uh, Dr. Gibson makes some very good points. Uh, he, he's writing in a book which defends the scriptural story of uh, Genesis, and the first ten chapters are on the theology. We talked about that earlier. Um, uh, then there's the five chapters on uh, uh, science, including intelligent design, cosmology, the limits of evolution, critiques of evolutionary theory, which is what this is and then the flood, which we had last week. Um, then there's a chapter on evolutionary ethics and uh, the attempt to meld evolution with uh, some kind of creation, which obviously Darwin would not have approved of, as you noted. Um, critics will say that the chapter is one massive, quote, mine. So that's the structure that it's given. And I think this is mostly argumentation, uh, what we would call spin in the political uh, realm, that should not be taken seriously. One can quote someone in such a way as to mean something entirely different from what the person intended. Um, and that, I think, is quote mining, but uh, I don't think that's what's being done here. You'll notice that a lot of the things that he's quoting are a whole paragraph at a time, so that you do get the full context. Uh, the last quote in particular is noteworthy. Something similar was shown to C.S. Lewis by the same author, by the way. Um, and I, unfortunately, I didn't have time to run this down uh, precisely, uh, but it's in The Weight of Glory, uh, which is a book by C.S. Lewis. Uh, Lewis quotes Professor Watson, who wrote that evolution, quote, is accepted by zoologists not because it has been observed to occur, and no, notice how similar this is to his other quote that we just read, or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. Um, and I should have closed quotes on that. In another essay, after again quoting Watson, Lewis asked rhetorically, does the whole vast structure of modern naturalism depend not on positive evidence, but simply on a priori metaphysical prejudice? Was it devised not to get in facts, but to keep out God? Uh, and now that we've gone through, um, you've heard my take. You've heard um, 
my best presentation of the of what uh, uh, Jim Gibson was talking about. And now it's your turn to make comments and ask questions. Um, yeah, we do have an announcement before we go on to that. Oh, thank you, Paul. This is simply to remind all of you that next week there will not be a class here. We are meeting in the Randall Visitors Amphitheater, and we have a, a special uh, guest speaker. His name is David Newman. And uh, if you don't recognize that name, he, is, uh, he has quite a history. For years, he was editor of Ministry Magazine, he has been now for some years pastoring what is known as the Damascus Road Church in the Washington area. I should say the Silver Spring area, pardon me. Um, and currently he is editor of Adventist Today. And uh, uh, he's going to be my house guest as a matter of fact, but I asked him would he be willing to speak to an assembly of people here? He said, by all means. And I said, well, they'd better make it pretty good. And David Newman said he will speak next Sabbath at 10.30 on the subject of God's final warning is not what you think. So if you wonder just how, how things are going to wind up on planet Earth, uh, you have going to hear, you'll be hearing next Sabbath the concepts of a man who has spent his life thinking about the church and its mission in the world. So thank you, and uh, hope to see you there next Sabbath. And welcome, Dr. Javour. You're welcome. Good to see you. Uh, good to be here. Thank you so much, Paul, for this wonderful presentation. I just wanted to s re report that when I was um, still working here, I had a privilege of doing a sabbatical at UCLA in, in 1993, 1994, I believe. And they had a huge conference on creationism at UCLA, uh, attended by really thousands in, in a large auditorium. And uh, I attended a few of the lectures, but the one that I remember is by Ernst Meyer, who is, a, as you quoted, he's a systematic biologist. He's probably the, one of the most famous evolutionary uh, proponents of evolutionary theory. And much of his lecture went over my head, he, not being a biologist as such, but I was stunned by his final remark because this is what he said. What the most convincing evidence for himself, for evolution, for the tru truth of evolution is the universality of the genetic code. Going totally out of his field and becoming for a minute a molecular biologist. And I just, when I walked out of there, my head was just spinning, thinking, well, this is exactly what a creationist would say. The universality of the genetic code is a overwhelming evidence for a creator. And regarding the very important point that you made, and the, uh, with which I wholeheartedly, uh, or Jim Gibson made, with which I wholeheartedly agree, that underlying all this, these arguments in favor of evolution, one way or another, is a built-in prejudice against supernatural, the existence of the supernatural. We need to remind the world more forcefully that modern science was established by giants, intellectual giants who were believing in God and were trying to find out how God works in nature. It was the very supernatural that prompted uh, the believing of the lawgiver and the lawful world that prompted our founders of modern science. And for some reason, over the generations, this mantra of there is no God been just propagated, reinforced, and it's, it's now looked upon mm -hmm. as a truism. Now, um, I have two questions about that then. Number one, uh, if a universal genetic code 
is ev evidence for evolution. Then if we find that there are uh, fairly substantial variations in that code, is that evidence against evolution? Not the least, not the least, of course. You, <laughs> you, you just wiggle your way out and uh, say that over time there were some minor variations of that. But uh, first I mean, try to think of how you transform, let's say, mitochondria. Uh, you have all this nice working genetic material, and all of a sudden you change the meaning of the letters. Doesn't that throw a, a little monkey wrench? I mean, how do you, trans how do you change the code and, and change the book at the same time so it's now read properly in the new code? Well, I don't have to defend that kind of <laughs> argument, fortunately, but I don't think that would be a problem for evolutionists. They, well, they it, it depends. As in every, every instance, yeah. they find reasons why something works or something doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It depends on the evolutionist. I think that if, if somebody is an evolutionist because that's what they've always been taught and they just kind of went along with the flow, it might give them a little pause. Sure. On the other hand, if you're committed in the Laurentian uh, tradition, you're right. Uh, the evidence doesn't matter. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> my experience with discussions with evolution is that it really doesn't matter what you tell them. They are not going to change their views. <laughs> now, the other question I have is, you have a conference on creationism. Were there any creationists speaking at the conference? No, no, this was conference on evolutionary, evolutionism. Did I say creationism? Oh. Forgive oh, me for okay. that, forgive me for that. <laughs> I, you know, being a prof former professor, I'm absent-minded. I say something, mean something. This was a conference on evolutionary, okay. uh, evolutionary um, well, That theories. makes sense. Sure. Yes, Ariel? Uh, it seems to me one of the uh, deeper themes of this chapter is the uh, general approval of materialism by the scientific community, however you want to define that. Uh, we might say that at least the most accepted definition of the scientific community. And uh, because of that, it, it raises a question uh, which uh, I've been thinking about while uh, you were lecturing. Uh, seems to me, to a certain extent, there is a certain satisfaction in materialism. And that is that uh, it seems more objective than reality, if I can use another term, uh, to counter materialism. It, I object to just limiting our conclusions to materialistic ones because that's way too simplistic for the reality which we have about us, you know. <coughs> that, uh, uh, we have to eliminate uh, morality, responsibility, religion, uh, uh, ethics, uh, to a certain extent, and so on, uh, out of the picture if we're going to be pure materialists. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it pays for us to understand that, that uh, these scientists feel secure in this because they're adopting this simplistic mode uh, of approach to reality. Uh, I would add to it that you carry that mode too far and you're not going, it's not going to work. Uh, and of course, abiogenesis being uh, probably the classic example of it, uh, totally no, no answer for this. But getting a little, a little deeper into this uh, issue, I would raise the question, you know. Uh, these folks, they believe in this materialism and so on. They, they devote their whole lives to it, you know, and some, some do. Uh, all their efforts are in that direction and so on, and some are very dedicated to it. And uh, this involves a degree of what we call self-deception. Uh, they're not being dishonest. They are convinced this is what reality is all about. And uh, creationists, to a certain extent, c 
can say the same thing. I, uh, don't, don't, don't tell me this all happened uh, all by itself. I just can't swallow that uh, story. I mean, the complexities of life and all that. Uh, it, you know, it, it gets really overwhelming uh, that you, you can't believe in it. Uh, and uh, perhaps a, a question we can ask is, you know, uh, how do you avoid self-deception? Uh, and what is our best approach? And uh, I immediately think that, you know, a broad approach is, is far superior to a narrow one. Uh, it's trying to avoid self-deception, but uh, this is just a question I would raise. Is, 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 you know, uh, we're all subject to a certain amount of self-deception, and uh, our memories get very selective. When the older we get, the more selective they get, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this is something we, something we need to watch, uh, and that is uh, it's a problem that all human beings face. And uh, uh, but uh, we can one be understanding because of it to a certain extent, but also we need to avoid it. Uh, this and we, I think, this chapter is a prime example of this. Yes, um. I'm sure I missed a good presentation last week. I wasn't here. I was out of town. Um, I'd like to kind of bridge the gap between the two weeks since I wasn't here. Maybe we could have a little discussion on that. Um, traditionally, among Adventists and young Earth creationists, one of the really major arguments against Darwinian evolution is the uh, what I guess you'd call flood geology or putting um, all of the fossil record into the flood. Now I know Charles Darwin didn't have much use for the fossil record. He thought it was very incomplete and he was a gradualist and the fossil record does not support gradualism with rare exceptions like the horse series. Although he could deceive himself into believing that Charles Lyell had changed all that. Ah, yeah, okay. Now, what I'm wondering, this is kind of a sociological question um, within creationism, are we still at that juncture where perhaps the leading argument against evolution is flood geology? Are we willing to put that much weight on flood geology? Or as what I'm saying, maybe more within Adventism rather than non-Adventist creationist thought, there's a real emphasis on intelligent design. And now we're using the uh, Behean, Michael Behe arguments of intelligent design and microbiology, Dr. Javor mentioned that, molecular, uh, the molecular evidence that seems to be coming out really strong against evolution. So do you, this is just a question for discussion. Do you see that there is a shift in Adventism? I don't think so much with our uh, fundamentalist uh, friends like Answers in Genesis. They're really, really strong on flood geology. Um. I think that you're seeing two things going on. Uh, number one, uh, the, the arguments have actually been there for a long time, and in fact, they, uh, and people on the other side are rather frustrated that uh, the special creations used to use those arguments all the time. And that was, that's what Dwayne Gish did. Right. You know? Exactly. And he used to routinely. Uh, at least in the eyes of the people who came there, uh, best to his opponents. Right. Um, and those are mostly uh, intelligent design arguments. Yes. Uh, so those have actually been around for a long time. And now the intelligent design people have done it. And the thing that's frustrating to those people is that they can no longer use the geologic column against them. Because they say, oh, it's been a long age, it doesn't matter, but, right. but, but yeah. there's still things you can't explain. And so that's, that's really frustrated the, uh, the people on the other end. 
Uh, and I think they're due to be more frustrated because I think that the arguments can be sharpened into a way in which age has nothing to do with it and, and they have no explanation, period. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious that the best explanation is one of intelligence. And of course, the thing of it is, once you get to the argument for, for intelligence, then you're left with aliens and God and <coughs> the question becomes then where the aliens come from mm -hmm. and you're kind of stuck with something that is outside of nature is supernatural and probably the best definition of the term mm -hmm. because the intelligence that created all the other intelligences in whatever way it did um, had to be able to survive the Big Bang with an intact mind. Mm -hmm. I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Dwayne Gish. I first heard him debate when I was teaching at New Bow College, 1975, 76, or actually 1978, 79. He came over and debated a top, top um, vertebrate paleontologist at, in <laughs> England. So. Um, and he used basically those kind of arguments, the design arguments, and uh, he did not get into geology because he said, I'm not a geologist. So he didn't use <laughs> flood geology. That was his uh, technique. I think uh, you'll find uh, many of our friends like ICR, they're using geology because they're better trained now. I, I think you're exactly right about that. I mean, he was a, he was a chemist and, right. you know, biochemist, biochemist. And, of course, that leads to the natural biochemical arguments, which now molecular biology, I think, is just amplified. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't get to the age question at all. In fact, he avoided it to the point that I heard one person who knew mm -hmm. ICR people quite well suggests that maybe Dwayne Gish uh, didn't even believe in a young earth. I just heard that comment. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't verify from anything that uh, he wrote, of course. That well, he you can, you can see older. why people on the other side now are saying uh, that intelligent design is just creationism and cheap tuxedo. Exactly. Because wow. they're using the exact same arguments Gish used. Yes dressed with extra stuff because we have more yeah but but basically it's the the fundamental argument is the same and so uh, they they see it as a resurgence of the old creationism that they've been fighting for years right now i do think that there have been better arguments about age lately than there used to be right and and i think that you're seeing arguments on age being used more by ICR because of that. <laughs> exactly. I, I will have to confess that I helped him out a little bit. Andrew Snelling is a big name. That, yeah. um, but uh, uh, because I see that as the final, the final question, okay, once you give up and say there was a God, then the real question becomes, well, how long did it take? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that how long does it take and was there a universal flood are inextricably entwined with each other. Right. You can't get the fossil record in a short time without a flood. You just can't exactly. do it. Uh, but I think that there are starting to be some pretty good arguments, uh, carbon-14 being one of them. Um, the, the full impact of turbidites has not been felt, and the impact of the combination of turbidites and uh, paraconformities has not been felt. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a lot of massive geologic features that, that appear to have been created by massive flooding uh, that the geologic community has steadfastly looked the other way. And they're just now starting to realize how much there is. Uh, one of these days, it, it's going to be very fascinating to go back to some of the geomorphology stuff um, and this is the kind of thing that could be done on Google Earth, for example, and just, you know, fly people around it. The beauty is that, again, you're using stuff that everybody agrees is really there. Right. Uh, 
you have Ica stones and people can say, oh, that's just some guy who's a fraud. Uh, when you start saying there's carbon-14 in everything, or when you start saying, look in dinosaur bones and it's all over the place, uh, if we start getting DNA out of uh, Eocene material from uh, 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 Canada or Alaska. We need it from Green River, uh, some of Buchheim's stuff. Well, Buchheim, the thing of it is, the, the, uh, the Canada, Canadian and Alaskan stuff, the beauty behind it is that it's been frozen. That's true. Uh, some of that stuff isn't even compacted in the standard way. And it's all eocene, everybody agrees it's eocene. Mm -hmm. And you know you're starting to get DNA out of it. Mm -hmm. That's going to be really interesting to see what happens when that, when that uh, comes through. So I think what you're saying, it takes a two-pronged thrust. We have to deal with evolution in the biological realm and we can use genetics yeah. and design and so on, but we also uh, have to deal with the geological. We cannot separate the two, right? We do. And the other thing that we have to do very carefully is be careful when we make statements not to paint with too broad a brush. It isn't true. I, I mean, we just heard about Dwayne Gish, who I think everybody can pretty much agree is a short-age advocate. I would say so. But obviously, he steered away from arguing about short age because that wasn't his strong suit. Exactly. I think it not only wasn't his strong suit, but it wasn't creationist strong suit at that time. Not at that time. Um, nowadays, they're going after it, and the reason they're going after it is simply because they have more material to work with. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in Adventism, we have probably used a similar approach for a long time. The biochemical arguments were a lot easier to make, and we used that, and we really didn't deal that much with the age stuff. I think we're starting to deal more with the age stuff. I think that Ariel Roth has been a pioneer in that, and for that, I uh, really appreciate the work you've done. But I think that we're starting to, to move in a whole bunch of different fronts, and I think that we're coming to the place where it can... Uh, not only stand on its own two legs as a defensible theory, but as the most defensible theory as time is going on. I just would uh, add the comment that uh, to a certain extent, Adventism uh, stands or falls on this issue of uh, how much time you put in in terms of our faith in the Bible we're people of the book, and our belief that uh, in our Sabbath is a memorial of a six-day creation and so on, uh, you take that away, uh, you're going to uh, destroy uh, traditional Adventism, there's no question about it. That, uh, which, and there are inroads, of course, you know, any movement like ours, which is growing and so on, uh, uh, so on tends to, to drift, and uh, we're not as, I would say, as solid now in terms of our uh, basic beliefs uh, as we were 50 years ago. Uh, there, there are more inroads uh, in Adventist academia that we would not allow 50 years ago. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you say, uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that's hard to explain. Uh, and we'll get into, uh, I mentioned last week, that you weren't there, uh, Warren. Uh, uh, hard, it's hard to explain unless you uh, uh, think there was some major catastrophe here, the flood and so on, which reconciles the fossil record to, to a six-day creation. Now, uh, there are other ways of trying to reconcile it, I, I realize, but not uh, as I think as convincing as the fact that uh, most of the fossil record uh, uh, has to be f put into the uh, into the flood, and, uh, and you have to account. Uh, if I can repeat just a little bit what I said last week for you, Warren, <laughs> you have to account for all the animals that were alive uh, at the time of the flood. If you put most of the flood, I mean, that means dinosaurs were alive then. And, uh, and uh, Calamites and uh, Lepidodendron and uh, 
uh, cordites, you, you know those uh, coal uh, trees there in the uh, Permian and so on, uh, they had to be there. And uh, it seems to me that the best solution there we have on that is to uh, keep in mind this biological competition and suggestions from oxygen 18 that temperatures were warmer in the past uh, before people were driving cars around. Uh, just a little comment on the side about global warming. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you know, I see that as kind of a, you know, the, the best solution uh, in terms of uh, putting the Bible and what we see in nature together. I will make one other comment, and that is that when we're discussing this, we need to keep in mind that it's too easy to fall into a uniformitarian perspective that is not justified by the biblical record. And I'll just give you one example. I've heard many people complain that, that you can't find angiosperm pollen in uh, lower levels. Well, first of all, there is some stuff in the... Uh, in the Precambrian of uh, Venezuela that looks like there was some. And that's hotly debated with the people, with the people saying, but we were very careful with our samples and it, it has to be. And of course it's not contaminated by modern, it's contaminated by ancient stuff, contaminated in quotes. Um, whereas the, the other people will say, but it couldn't have been there because if it does, it totally upsets evolutionary theory. Maybe it does. Um, but beyond that, there's actually a rational reason why you might not find angiosperm pollen scattered all over the place. What scatters it today? <coughs> Mostly wind and, wind and rain. Yeah. Okay, think about this. If the wind is like two miles an hour, it's not going to do a lot of scattering. If there is no rain, rain is not going to scatter it. It's not going to get washed down by rivers. Um, at a certain point, you actually start to say, well, maybe the angiosperm pollen it wasn't at the, uh, at the lower levels because it didn't get washed down. And that's just drawing on quasi-standard. Maybe you could argue that uh, some people wouldn't necessarily buy that, but certainly the biblical record is consistent with that kind of a picture uh, to where you don't get angiosperm pollen scattered all over everything could because things don't get moved around as much as they do in today's world. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we have to do is we have to go back and we have to rethink things not using modern analogies but realizing that the pre-flood world was much different from what we have today. Wow. Uh, e according to the biblical record, and, and that we have to build our models accordingly. So I think we have to be really careful about making assumptions because it's too easy to take a very uniformitarian assumption is to say that everything is the same way as it was before. I had to do the same thing with carbon-14 dating. I have, we're finding variations in the amount of carbon-14 in, in very old material. It's not very much, it's like maybe double or triple or so, but it's significantly more than we have today. Today we have extremely efficient mixing. But then again, we have storms that uh, you know, mix things very efficiently. You didn't have storms back then. So that maybe carbon-14 was in the pre-flood world was very much like uh, chlorine-36 in the modern world, where it pretty much gets formed, drops down to the ground, and stays there. And so there are very high concentrations where the cosmic rays are forming it the most heavily in the atmosphere. Today it's about 45 degrees. So perhaps the carbon-14 in the atmosphere back then, when it was being formed, would be concentrated closer to the magnetic poles and spare the equator, for example. Uh, we have to think outside of the box so much, and we're not going to get any help from the other side. So it's something we have to do. Uh, Gilbert. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about what we were talking about this morning. And we have a microbiologist here. 
might be able to help. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, that is about the announcement this last week um, about uh, uh, DNA having a 521 year half life. Now, has anybody ever done any? We, we had these preserved species that were fossilized or uh, preserved in ice or mummified. And so they obviously have retained uh, more of their DNA and structural features than uh, they would have otherwise if it had been warm. Um, but since they are decaying, and there's probably most of the information I would suspect is probably gone, um, has anybody done any experiments to find out how this kind of preservation actually affects like things like carbon dioxide in, in a specimen. And I was wondering, and you mentioned this before, I was wondering how much uh, uh, radioactive uh, material was in the uh, genetic chemistry. And you said, well, it was a little bit. Um, can you make any further statements on that? Well, OK. Here's an analogous process, and that is that amino acids can be usually attacked by a base or by, a, um, uh, by an acid and lose the proton in the middle of uh, that's, that's making them left-handed. And then when it comes back on, uh, if it's a free amino acid, it's exactly randomly distributed. If it's, a, if it's an amino acid that's in a protein, it may not come back exactly randomly, but there is a certain chance that you'll get the proton on the, on the wrong side. And so you have what they used to call L amino acids now become a 50% mixture of L and D. And um, that process, if you do it at a constant temperature and a constant wetness, which usually you know means like nearly 100 percent wetness, like in solution, um, there will be a constant at which this rate of what they call racemization takes place, going from all L to 50 percent L and 50 percent D. By the way, if you start out with all D, it will also get to 50% L and 50% D. It goes to the racemic mixture, the half and half mixture, eventually. Um, that is a constant, but you put the constant in quotes. And the reason why is because a four degrees centigrade difference in the temperature can double the rate. So it's hugely temperature dependent. And that's one of the reasons why amino acid dating, even though it was a nice idea, kind of gradually fell out of favor. That and the other problem was that it consistently, it seemed to shut down at, the, at about 5,000 radiocarbon years, more or less, um, to where the to where the racemization of the very old material is very similar to the racemization of the younger material. This effect is noted in the literature, and Robert Brown did an article for Origins that uh, blew, I think, first Robert Brown, and then <laughs> Ariel Roth as the editor <laughs> completely away uh, to where. Uh, you know, millions of years suddenly collapsed into, I think the statistics seem to argue for 18,000 years, but the spread is so big that, you, that I wouldn't put too much faith in the exact year that it would, that it would put it into. But it, but it pulled things down to very short, very short life. And realizing that there's a certain amount of selectivity with what's being published and so forth, it might be that, that we're looking at biased data there too. But in any case, it's much, much less than what you would expect. Um, but the problem is that the people who don't like it say, well, the temperatures were just much less during that time. And after all, we're talking about the Ice Age, so it 
makes a kind of reasonable or half reasonable argument. Um, if we ever can break through that 4, 000, uh, that four million year barrier, if we start getting 50 million year old stuff that does the same thing, which reminds me, I, I need to ask um, Lee Spencer whether he's done any work on the amino acids and their racemization constants on the material that he's got there because that would be fascinating. This material is supposed to be 40 million years old and the first 36 million years it wasn't frozen. So that's going to be very interesting to see whether there's any left and if there is, you know, how much there is. We might be, uh, we might be able to make some very strong arguments out of that about because of the preservation of the material. Um, there are two attempts to, to hunt for DNA. Well, actually, probably more than that. Uh, Lee Spencer's doing it some at uh, Southern Adventist University. Um, but there are some other ones as well. Uh, and, and probably the most remarkable one that seems to have come about is spores that are 250 million years old, uh, supposedly from the, uh, I think it's the Permian of, um, of uh, the Great Salt Beds in, uh, in New Mexico and Texas. Mostly New Mexico. 240 million. 240 million. Uh, and, and, and they were able to grow these bacteria. And this is, an, uh, this is an area where Adventists should be really interested, and other conservative Christians, I would say, too. Uh, it would be very fascinating to see what the DNA sequence is, how it compares with modern, how much evolution really has taken place in 250 years, uh, 250 million years. And, uh, uh, and also to see whether the old enzymes were more broadly effective than the newer ones. You see, if you're, if you're a creationist, you see things as gradually decaying. The genetic code is getting corrupted. That's the, um, uh, what is that guy's name, uh, Sanford hypothesis genetic entropy. On the other hand, if you're, if you're a believer in evolution, we continually are fine-tuning this stuff so it works better and better and better. It would be fascinating to see whether uh, you, know, you can distinguish between those two possibilities. I, th I think a basic question there is, is, is DNA uh, subject to uh, temperature variation as much as uh, amino acids are? If it is, we're going to end up into a very uh, murky picture, I think. Yes, you will, but except for one thing. If you've had it frozen for most of that time, then that suggests you can slow it down. Yeah, but you know, of course, if the stuff up there was not frozen for, the, for a while, you know. Y yeah, <laughs> well, it won't so, be perfect. Mm -hmm. But this is one of those things where, you know, like when I went into carbon-14, I didn't know that there would be carbon-14 in there. I just thought this is an interesting question given a creationist standpoint, and we ought to look. And we looked, and we looked first at the literature and we found it, and then we did our own experiments, uh, much thanks to the ICR for doing that, and they found it. And now it's, a pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to argue against it. Uh, we have a comment here. Uh, On those uh, 240 million year old spores, is it what, what kind of depth uh, were they collected from? Or what kind of, what was the burial history of the sediments about, about that they were in? About a mile down in salt beds. And they were actually found within solid salt crystals. So that unless you recrystallized it, they couldn't have gotten in there. And, and they were able to grow these. Oh yeah. They got them. Oh yeah. It's in the it's in the scientific literature. I did a I did a presentation on it once. Wow. I it, I'd, I'd be interested to see the, the what the paper on uh, that is. I'll, I'll see what I can do to to find that. Okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's rather amazing to think about it. 
you can always holler contamination, but uh, it, it looks interesting. Well, see, this is the crazy part, of course. The people who are doing this say, look, these salt crystals, they haven't moved, you know. We went inside, we drilled inside of them, we sterilized the drill with uh, this 1% per uh, hydrochloric acid and 1% sodium uh, hydroxide. I mean, it kills everything, right? Okay, and in fact, after they grew the stuff, they smeared the stuff all over the crystal and they found out that it killed uh, all but one part in 10 to the minus 11, the, pr the treatment that they did. So it should have killed, I mean, it should have killed the stuff. It should have killed the stuff. There's, there's no way. Um, and, and so their argument is, we did all this stuff right. And this is what we got. And so it's there. And of course, the other guys are saying, there's no way it could last for 250 million years. And in my opinion, they're both right. Which, of course, leads to the obvious question, has it really been 250 million years? Anyway. So next week, we will not be here. We will uh, be here the week after. And, and uh, you will either be resuming the book, or I may have a video for you if I, if I get things done right. <laughs>